The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... Can you have disagreements in a home between the mother and the father and still have love? You've got to know how to talk about these disagreements in an agreeable way. You can disagree without being disagreeable, right? For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Everlasting Gospel video series. The message today is dealing with the very simple principles. We're going to look at a number of scriptures on this. Dealing with the subject of divided or united. Talking about the right kind of unity, the wrong kind of unity, and why it's so important for us to be together, to be one as families, as communities, as a church. First of all, there's a principle that the devil operates under, and it's called divide and conquer. Every military general has always known that the way that you conquer an opposing force is you flank them, you do this pincer movement, you get in, you separate their forces, you break them up, and then it's a lot easier to overcome them. You read about this in Acts chapter 20. Paul realized that the devil was going to use these tactics on God's church. He warned them. He said, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, also from among your own selves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. The devil will send in some, they will be counterfeit Christians and they will bring in division. They'll try and split you up. I um, ordered this recent DVD series, it, this spectacular photography, it was called Planet Earth. Some of you probably saw it, it produced by BBC and you sort of have to hold your nose a little bit when it talks about evolution, but the, the natural photography was just outstanding. And they showed one scene up in the Arctic regions of the north where this pack of wolves were hunting reindeer. And they had a helicopter that was able to videotape them in their natural environment. They had this camera where the lens was enormous and they had a gyro that eliminated any vibration. They were able to take long distance high resolution photography such as they've never taken before. Yeah, the technology had been developed by the military. And so the helicopter was not interrupting the hunt that it was observing. Almost a, a mile away and yet it was able to take this close-up photography of these wolves chasing these reindeer and the way that they worked as a pack in an organized way to get one of them separated from the flock. If they could get one separated from the, other, the rest of the herd, then pretty soon they ran it down, they wore it out, and they had it for dinner. Lions do the same thing. Matter of fact, Peter talks about this. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, he goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. But this is the devil's plan is to separate the lambs from the flock and then bring them down. It's a divide and conquer. He does it in the church. He does it in communities. He does it in families. And maybe that's where we ought to begin. The devil tries to bring division into families. Now I'm starting here because families are really the foundation block of communities and nations and churches. And it's so important that we learn to have harmony there in the home. I know we often say at our wedding ceremonies how marriages are made in heaven, but let's not forget thunder and lightning is made in heaven too. And in many of the families there is division. And it's through the Spirit of the Lord that this harmony can be brought back in. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 has a principle for us to remember to have unity and harmony in these families rather than division. It says, let no one seek his own 
but each one the other's well-being. Now I'm coming to you from the perspective of both someone who is married, though I am a bachelor, I am a married bachelor, and also someone who is a pastor that has done a lot of marriage counseling. I have no real qualifications in marriage counseling other than I've just done a lot of it. It's not my favorite thing to do, but one thing I've observed both in my family and in the counseling I've done in almost every example where there is strife and division in the families it's because someone is seeking after their own rather than the others. It's usually pride and selfishness at the heart of it most of the time on both parties and if, you know, it could be the children, the parents, it could be multiple parties, could just be the husband and wife, very rarely is it one but it's selfishness. People seeking their own. The principle for developing unity in these relationships, let no one seek his own but each one the other's well-being. And again, what happened in the beginning? How did the devil operate with Adam and Eve? After sin, they ran from God, they tried to cover their own nakedness. Look at what happened. The man said to the Lord, God said, you know, what is this that you've done? Who told you you were naked? Man said, the woman, it's her fault. You gave her to be with me. She gave me of the tree and I ate. The recriminations and blame and fear. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? She said, it's the serpent that deceived me and I ate. They started blaming others for what they had done wrong. Instead of saying, I'm going to take responsibility. And then of course the Lord spoke to the serpent and the serpent didn't say anything because he didn't have a leg to stand on, right? Mark chapter 10 verse 7 through 9 Jesus said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they too shall become one flesh. They are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together let not man separate. Marriage is a metaphor for the church in the Bible and the church is a metaphor for marriage. That's why it's important for us to understand unity in the church, to have unity in our homes. And the Bible tells us in the same way, way that Christ loves the church and gave himself for the church, a husband should love his wife and wives should love their husbands. There should be this, this oneness and the same terminology that Jesus uses in identifying his relationship with the Father his love for the church, that there should be this, this unity, this oneness, is what we should experience in our families. Some of these differences come into the marriage relationships because sometimes there's a difference. One is a believer, one is not. And you've got a built-in division. So what do you do? Well, obviously get divorced and marry a believer, right? Wrong. You might find yourself in the circumstances where two unbelievers are married, one becomes a believer, now what do they do? The spouse, the husband or the wife just doesn't happen to believe for whatever reason. Do you separate or are you still married? The Bible says that the unbelieving husband can be converted by beholding. This is a, is it First Peter chapter 3, the conversation, the behavior of the wife has a sanctifying converting influence. You stay together and your number one missionary field is your unconverted spouse. And before you think, well, I'm going to go divorce her, divorce him, and marry a believer, we'll go do mission work overseas. It'd be so wonderful to be one. God has given you a mission project. They're in your house. <laughs> Try and reach your unconverted spouse, not by badgering them or pressuring them or nagging them into the church, but as they behold your conversation. Let them see the, the joy and the, the love, the how superior your life is because of your relationship with Jesus. Let me read this to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 13. And a woman who has a husband that does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let him not divorce him, let her not divorce him, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the believing husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. This is something I don't even completely understand, but it seems to be saying that 
in the same way Joseph's believing influence sanctified the house of Potiphar there was a blessing there and the Bible tells the disciples when they went out preaching he says when you enter into a house say peace or shalom to this house and the son of peace will be there that the believing spouse in this household invites the presence of the Spirit the Son of God into that home and it has a sanctifying influence on your children does it make a difference the children of believers if they are not yet at the age of accountability can you expect to see them in the kingdom if they die before they reach that age yeah there's something there and, and and I don't even claim to understand it all but by all means if you can stay together stay together and then Paul says you know if the unbeliever departs let him depart you're not under bondage in such cases but don't drive them away and say well they left now, I've seen that game before God knows your heart you want to do everything you can to make it work amen and if there is division if there are disagreements and if there are children have enough sense not to bicker in front of the children nothing creates more insecurity especially for young children when they see mom and dad going at it like wolves it, it just creates a fear and an insecurity and all kinds of other psychological problems start to bubble up in their lives when they don't see love between mom and dad can you have disagreements in a home between the mother and the father and still have love you've got to know how to talk about these disagreements in an agreeable way you can disagree without being disagreeable right and you've got to develop that art and if something pops up and there's a you know the children are in the room and there's this disagreement say uh, mom could we go into the room for a minute and uh, talk a little bit and excuse yourself shut the door and then the kids will hear the plates breaking in the other room and stuff <laughs> but at least you know they they think you're just playing in there <laughs> having harmony in your homes requires work having harmony in our church requires work and by the way just in case you're wondering I'm not preaching this message about unity and division because there's some great schism in the church there's not this is a preemptive strike there's great harmony in this church and I want to keep it all right we need unity in our families amen, amen. it takes work it takes investment have regular devotions in your family you've heard it said many times a family that prays together stays together it's also true the family that plays together stays together do things together well this whole message is not just about families there's also division in countries and communities and racial division cultural division now I lump that all together because I think it's interesting right now especially in a political season and this is a unique political season where you have all kinds of different people from different perspectives and different backgrounds and different genders and different races all running and you know it has a tendency to polarize a nation as Christians I'm not taking a political position here but I will tell you what the Bible says about unity that we are all one people Acts 17 verse 26 there's no room for racism in the Christian belief amen, amen. and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings we are all made of one blood and you know the debate on immigration is heating up and there, there are there, there's fear and frustration and it creates division but as a people as a country we ought to love each other as Christians we ought to understand love it doesn't matter if if I'm on my way home from church and and I get hit by a Mack truck and I get cut and I start to bleed and they take me to the hospital and they say they're out of blood and they ask for donors if an illegal Mexican alien with the same blood type as me shows up it doesn't matter I'll praise the Lord we are all made of that one blood it'll save my life right yeah. and we sometimes forget that and I even though I speak a little Spanish I don't even need to be able to speak that language for that blood to save my life Amen. Yeah. Galatians chapter 3 verse uh, 27 28 as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek there's neither slave nor free there's neither male nor female you are all one in Christ 
We do all have differences, don't we? Makes it interesting. But those differences should not separate us. They should unite us. But there are certain foundational things that if a person is wrong on those, the whole train starts jumping track. And those, uh, those truths should be vigorously defended and we should speak the same thing. You know what's wonderful for me is I get to travel and I'll go to another country that has very different customs. And I remember being in Japan and you know the, the service was a little different. You take off your shoes and but they believe the same thing from the Bible. I believe we spoke the same thing. And you could go to China, you could go to New Guinea, and it's wonderful getting together with these Bible Christians in their huts. They spoke the same thing. How do we get that kind of unity? If we're all reading the same book, we're going to speak the same thing. That's the, that's the key to having that kind of unity. Unfortunately, do you know one reason that there are a lot of different churches in communities? Because there's a split in the church. I can't tell you how many times a church has gone through a building program or a decorating program and the contention is so sharp over something that they say, well, we'll just go and build our own church. And so because of the division, a church splits into two. And a few years later, now there's two options where people can go. And it ends up working out as a blessing, but it wasn't healthy right when it happened. If our unity advertises our, if our love and unity advertises for Christ, our division advertises for the devil. Right? How many times have you heard someone say, oh man, I would, they're all at each other's throats. I mean, look at the Christians in Ireland, Protestants, Catholic, killing each other, Christians, ha, ha, ha. So the division, it evangelizes for the devil. The unity evangelizes for Jesus. The Lord says so much about oneness. Now, when I say that, I'm talking about God says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. But then he says, God said, Let us make man in our image. God, that one God is God the Father, Son, and Spirit. You got one family, two people, maybe the children. They become one flesh through love. There needs to be a oneness in our hearts, a oneness in our purpose. You know, it's a marvel to me. You ever watch these birds, these flocks, that are flying through the sky, and you wonder, who's in charge? And, you know, they just kind of turn in a cloud, and, and uh, it's amazing to me. It's like they've all got one part of their brain. They're all in touch with the other, and I've done a lot of scuba diving. And you're down in the ocean, you see these beautiful massive schools of silvery fish and they swim around some buoy or obstacle and they part just long enough to get around it and they're back together again. It's like they're just, there's a oneness to their movement and God is inviting us to be one. There's a number of verses on this that uh, I'm sure you know. In our memory verse we talked about John 17 but we did not read verse 11. Jesus said, Now I am no longer in the world but these are in the world. Jesus is praying. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. <whistles> what kind of oneness does the Lord want us to have with each other? Can you think of a higher example of oneness than the oneness of Jesus and the Father? He said that they may be one as we are one. <whistles> That's a pretty tall order. One mind. Philippians chapter 2 verse 2. Notice how often it says this in the Bible. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Doesn't mean we're all cloned. We all think exactly the same. But when it comes to loving each other we have the mind of Christ. That we might be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. If we allow the same, I'm sorry, if we all follow the same word that's, uh, these are my notes in here. <laughs> if we all follow the same word, we will have the same mind. If we have the word in our mind, we'll be of the same mind. Philippians 4, verse 2, I implore Eurodia and I implore Synthesi to be of the same mind in the Lord. 1 Peter 3, 8, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. You know, church members are something like coals in a fire that we just don't burn when we're separated from each other. 
uh, two pieces of wood keep burning a lot better than if you have one wood, one piece of wood and you plop it on the fire. We, we, we warm each other as sharpen, as iron sharpens iron through our staying together we develop this oneness, this unity. And then we want to talk a little bit about being one flock. Jesus said in John 10, 16, Other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they'll hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The Lord wants us to have this unity in our midst. Now, when I started talking about flock there, not only am I thinking of sheep, uh, I remember reading something I may have shared with you years ago about some lessons from geese. And I don't know if they're flying north right now, but uh, someone observed in the fall when you see geese heading south for the winter that you might be interested in what science has learned about uh, the way they cooperate to get where they're going and why they fly in these V formations. As each bird flaps its wing, it creates uplift for the bird immediately behind it. Flying in a V formation, the whole flock adds 71% greater flying range than if any bird is flying alone. How many of you driving down the road have gotten in the back draft of a truck before? You get up there, you know, just uh, one or two car lengths behind a uh, large semi, you can let off your gas and you can maintain your same speed because you're caught in the back draft of that truck. Now he's paying for it. The one, the lead goose is really having to flap, but all the others benefit by staying in a formation and going the same direction. As opposed to when they go off on their own, it creates drag for everybody. If we all move together, even if you might disagree with the lead goose, if we all move in the same direction, it is so much easier. When a goose gets sick or is wounded and falls out of formation, two geese follow it down to the ground and they help and protect him. They stay with him until he's either able to fly again or until he's dead. When one of us, and then they join another formation and catch up with their group. When one of us is down or out, it's up to the others to stand by them. For one thing, the Lord hates dividers. Now, I'm not talking about file dividers that are in your file cabinet. I'm talking about people dividers. Some people are insecure and they seem to find some kind of hellish satisfaction by going around dividing others. They feel like they don't have any friends or they're insecure about their friendships so they don't want anyone to be anyone's friend except them. And so they, they go around and they gossip and they divide and they, they spread things that they shouldn't spread. Proverbs 6 verse 14 and 15. Perversity is in his heart. He devises evil continually. He sows discord. You picture a person going around throwing seed. These people are throwing out weeds, weeds of division. They sow discord. Therefore, his calamity will come suddenly. Suddenly, he'll be broken without remedy. Proverbs 6, verse 16. This is really heavy. These six things the Lord hates. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to run into evil, a false witness who speaks lies, notice this last one, and one who sows discord among brethren, one who spreads division among brethren. Jesus is the great uniter. Christ and His cross is the cost of our division. Sin separated us from God. Jesus came to earth to create a bridge once again, to unite heaven and earth. Not only does the cross create this kind of unity, the cross creates this kind of unity. You've heard it said, the closer we come to Jesus, the closer we will come to one another. So what's the key for us to have more unity in our families, more unity in our church, in our community? If we keep our eyes on Jesus and we move towards Him, as the single goal, you're going to see that we can't do anything but invariably come closer together. If we say, Lord, you've forgiven me so much, I'm willing to forgive others. If we embrace His forgiveness as our own and we pass it on, it'll bring us together. There are some people, they might annoy us. There, there are things that people do that are, are different. There are different views. In spite of all those things, that is the best culture to be a real Christian to learn how to love each other in spite of the differences, to be like Christ.
Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. Hello, friends. I'm supposing that you know that Amazing Facts is 100% viewer supported. If you have appreciated these programs, if it's been a source of encouragement for you, and if it's blessed your life, we'd love to hear from you. The only way we can stay on this network and these stations is because viewers just like you contact us and let us know. Why don't you drop us a line or even go to the website, amazingfacts.org, and send us a note of encouragement and support so we can stay on the air. Jesus came to set the captives free. All of us are under this curse of death. And we all struggle being imprisoned or chained by sin. It doesn't matter what your chains might be, the Lord can break your chains. Thank you for joining us for this broadcast. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents, Central Study Hour, Everlasting Gospel, Bible Answers Live, and Wonders in the Word. You'll also find a storehouse of biblical resources geared towards answering some of your most difficult questions. And our online Bible school is just a click away. One location, so many possibilities. Amazingfacts.org. Friends, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, the Bible states that no one can serve two masters. It's an impossibility to truly live a life of integrity while cheating on your taxes or making decisions that are morally questionable. Christianity is more than a weekend activity. It's a daily choice to do the right thing, even though everything around you might be crumbling. That's why we'd like to offer you this special book entitled Alone in the Crowd. Satan's attack on Christ Church and the family has intensified. This book will share some practical steps to help you have a joyful Christian life even though the world might be falling apart. So call our toll-free number and ask for offer number 714. Or if you prefer, you can visit our website at www.amazingfacts.org. You can still write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 714, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. We pray this edition of Amazing Facts Presents has blessed you. So until we meet again, remember the encouraging words of Jesus, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. Proceeding was a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Everlasting Gospel video series. The message today is dealing with a very simple principles. We're going to look at a number of scriptures on this dealing with the subject of divided or united. Talking about the right kind of unity, the wrong kind of unity, and why it's so important for us to be together, to be one as families, as communities, as a church. A pack of wolves were hunting reindeer. And they had a helicopter that was able to videotape them in their natural environment they had this camera where the lens was enormous and they had a gyro that eliminated any vibration. They were able to take long distance high resolution photography such as they've never taken before. Uh, the technology had been developed by the military. And so the helicopter was not interrupting the hunt that it was observing. Almost a, a mile away and yet it was able to take this close-up photography of these wolves chasing these reindeer and the way that they worked as themselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things 
to draw away disciples after themselves. The devil will send in some. They will be counterfeit Christians and they will bring in division. They'll try and split you up. I um, ordered this recent DVD series. It was just spectacular photography. It was called Planet Earth. Some of you probably saw it at, produced by BBC and you sort of have to hold your nose a little bit when it talks about evolution but the, the natural photography was just outstanding and they showed one scene up in the Arctic regions of the north where this pa first of all there's a principle that the devil operates under and it's called divide and conquer every military general has always known that the way that you conquer an opposing force is you flank them you do this pincer movement you get in you separate their forces you break them up and then it's a lot easier to overcome them. You read about this in Acts chapter 20. Paul realized that the devil was going to use these tactics on God's church. He warned them. He said, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, also from among your own... The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... Can you have disagreements in a home between the mother and the father and still have love? You've got to know how to talk about these disagreements in an agreeable way. You can disagree without being disagreeable, right? For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts, 